Andy, thanks for doing this today. Really appreciate your time. Uh, we're here to discuss the results of the Pompey Supporters Trust survey. Um, thousands of Pompey supporters took part. I'm really pleased with the, uh, the response from everyone. We thought it'd be great to sit down with you and just pick out some of the main themes and topics that have come out of that. Um, I think for me, the main headline is really everyone's really happy. There's a wide range of topics we've asked people about. And actually, there were a real number of things that supporters came back to us and said they're really delighted with at the moment. They're really pleased with the way the club's operating. What were some of the big positives that you picked out from the survey? Um, I think, first of all, Donald, just to say thank you to you and the PST for putting a survey together. Um, I think it's really incredibly helpful to the football club to understand what supporters want, but equally how well we're performing against some of the things that matter most to them. Um, understanding what matters most to them as well as how well we deliver against them. So uh, grateful that the time and effort that was put into survey, not just into constructing it, but into the amount of in-depth analysis that went into it, two and a half thousand responses you received, which is absolutely amazing. So, uh, and then to filter through all of those to try and understand what the key answers were, uh, and then to share them with supporters. Um, I cannot thank the PST enough for doing that. I think some of the things we're particularly pleased about would be um, understanding what really matters to people, financial sustainability, obviously the football, uh, two of the things that really stand out and where you know people are, are particularly happy with. I think um, safety for me is always important uh, at any football club. We need to create an environment where people feel safe to come themselves and bring their families, uh, feel secure, not threatened in any way. Um, and it was good to see that resonated really, really well with people. I think the match day experience as well is something that we particularly uh, worked hard on uh, over the last couple of years to try and improve that. Um, really pleased with the way that the uh, fan zone uh, has taken off and people use it and it creates a buzz. I remember before one of the games we played, um, I think it might have been the Bolton game uh, and John Massinho arrived and the fan zone was in full swing for that for that evening game and he just said coming into the ground, you know, wait, wait, you know, when you get inside the ground and the game starts, we got our own special atmosphere but it was being created a long way before that. So. Uh, and that hasn't you know, been manufactured in any way. It's come about through the efforts of supporters working with the football club uh, to come up with the ideas as to how we could make that work and improve it and something we can, can, you know, we can continue with. Um, you know, financial sustainability, really important. We'll come on to talk about that in a minute. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's, you know, what we don't want to do is ever jeopardise this club's future uh, in a way that uh, you know, it, it, it was before fan ownership. You mentioned financial sustainability there. That really came through in the results of the survey. Fans told us that was one of the very most important topics to them. Obviously, Pompey, we've had our own history of that. There's reasons that that's so important to fans. Um, I think anyone that was there at Peterborough at the weekend, you know, you'd probably be forgiven for getting a little bit carried away. I certainly was at 5 p.m. in Peterborough. Um, I think lots of fans, inevitably, we're looking ahead a little bit to next year about a potential return to the championship. Right now, fans are really happy with the fi financial sustainability with the club. Is that achievable in the championship? Can you be successful in the championship and financially sustainable at the same time? I think you can. Um, I think um, it's a challenge when you win promotion to any division. Um, yes, the revenues go up, but equally the costs uh, go up as well. Uh, and it's about how much you know, financial sustainability is not necessarily about breaking even. It's about how much you know, your, your owners are prepared to invest to keep you sustainable. Uh, and we're very, very fortunate with the ownership that we've got in terms of what they've done over the last five years, slowly but surely, is built up, you know, the infrastructure around the stadium. So yes, we get into a championship, and if you go back to the last set of accounts for across all football clubs in the championship, 21-22, obviously people in the moment are uh, uh, releasing their, their accounts for 22-23 season, but in 21-22, the average loss for a championship club was £16 million. So you're quite right um, to raise that as a potential concern for the club going forward. But um, there's a number of things that are happening. Um, we're seeing a new squad um, a salary uh, cap ratio that's going to come into, in, in, into place very shortly. The championship club owners, the majority, the vast majority of championship club owners want to see that because you know so many clubs have gambled and they've got themselves into financial difficulties because the owners decided to take on the parachute payment clubs, which is one of the insane things in the championship. 104 million pounds coming down to a parachute club to compete and compete with clubs that are earning you know the best part of seven to eight million pounds from central distributions if you're not a parachute club and that's not competition uh, and 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 we've seen a lot of tr clubs try and gamble 
Um, you know, we've seen Derby. The owners put a lot of money into Derby, previous owner. Um, they didn't succeed and um, had to step away. We've seen the same with Reading um, at the moment, where the Reading owner did, you know, put, it, put, put in significant sums of money into that club to chase the dream of promotion, didn't succeed. And there's now, obviously, the club is going through its own turmoil um, at the moment in terms of where supporters are. Um, so there are two good examples and I think clubs are now looking at that and saying you know we need to have these costing controls in place and that for the first time I'm sensing there is a, that there's unity between club owners and trying to do something. Certainly we're seeing today the football governance bill uh, be, be absolutely confirmed that it's now going to go through Parliament, um, start its passage. We are absolutely supportive of that, 100%. Very grateful to um, our local MPs, Stephen Morgan, um, Penny Morden, Carolyn, Dame Caroline Dynage, who have all played a significant part in their commitment towards getting this bill off and running and through Parliament. And we look forward to their support on that going through. Incredibly important we do this because it's going to make all clubs more, more, more secure, more financially sustainable and able to compete. But I just want to reflect back on sustainability and how we do do it in the championship. Um, we've obviously looked at uh, our own numbers. Um, I mentioned before that the owners are doing this in a, in a slow way. If you go back over the last five years, some of the things that they've done, um, they came in, um, they built a new club store. That uh, was one of the first things that happened. We should see record sales this year. We're fast approaching two million pound in terms of revenue. Uh, that's not the profit or contribution we make, but nevertheless, that's a significant headline figure for us to move towards. And Nike and Just Sport have been incredible, uh, particularly this season, in helping us build that and secure that. Obviously, we had the initial uh, with the roofing and the cladding problems we had around the stadium. Uh, that was all put right. They then invested in a you know a, a 15 million pound investment within Stratton Park itself uh, and you can see the improvements. When I came here, um, the capacity was set at 16,000. One of my first meetings uh, was a meeting with Building Control and, 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 and those responsible for safety that indicated the capacity would soon fall to 12, 10,000 if we didn't actually complete the works. And we fought to get that capacity lifted a little bit more above 16 because we were starting the works and we were successful in doing that. But now, as you know, um, you mentioned the fantastic away support at Peterborough and part, I'm very privileged to be part of an incredible experience there. But equally, uh, the last two games against Burton, especially Oxford, where the wall of noise got us across the line. And you can see four stands with home supporters in the difference it actually can make to the team on the pitch. So, you know, we've now got that capacity secure. Um, we got to a point where we've sold 15,000 season tickets. We have a waiting list for season tickets coming in. Uh, there's a huge demand for football going through. So that work's been done. We own our training ground. So again, that's something else that's been done. We're making significant improvements uh, to, to, to what's happening down at, Pom uh, um, at Pompey Health and Fitness Club and the training ground itself. We'll be moving the first team into the main building over the summer. Um, so the coaches and the players will have their own common room, they'll have their own facilities, they'll have an analysis suite, an own gym up there, private gym, they'll have the uh, medical facilities um, and the academy will be in that same building as well. So we've got connectivity between all the operations and the football department. Uh, in terms of service, the other things we're doing is we've built up, we've built up a really, really good relationship with Piglet's Pantry who have improved the food and drink on match days. Um, and what we've seen there, again, is turnover treble in the space of three years through that partnership and being able to sell alcohol um, in areas where we previously were unable to do so because certain bars were in view of the pitch or we just couldn't serve alcohol from them in the first place. Um, but the food offering, um, I think, has been well received. That came through loud and clear in the survey. Um, and we will improve that further next summer. Uh, this summer coming up, we'll create some new mezzanine floors in the North Stand. We started work on that this week. Um, we're gonna improve the number of toilet facilities up in the North Stand as well, and introduce more toilets into the Milton End, which from our early indications um, of the first couple of games in there we've had home supporters are, are badly needed. So we can use the building in the southeast corner uh, to complete that. So that work going on, and then we're looking at other ways we can be financially sustainable. What can we do on match days? Uh, Non-match days, sorry. Uh, and uh, the re-planned and proposed refurbishment of the Victory Lounge uh, will be quite significant in taking us a step forward in that direction. So 
we look at our commercial income. Um, we, at the moment, uh, we would rank in the top 10 of championship clubs in terms of what we're currently delivering in terms of ticketing and, and, and commercial revenue. So that, that, that's a good sign that we've got a good chance of being financially sustainable. And underpinning all that is the football model. Because the football model, um, you know, having that long-term plan, having that um, strategy now in place of what we want to do in terms of player recruitment, which I think supporters can now start to see that's bearing fruits. So whatever happens at the end of the season, um, you know, we've got a really, really good, strong squad for next season, whichever division we compete in. And uh, that's all underlined by reducing the expenditure on loan players. Um, we will still have loan players, it's important to do so, but we're not sort of spending twice as much as the next club in this division um, on, on loan players. We've recruited young players coming in, which will become assets for the football club, but equally I think those young players um, are first team ready and again are able to compete at either, in whichever division we play in. So I'm very confident about the future and I looked to Coventry and Luton last season who contested the playoff final. They weren't the richest clubs in the division by any means uh, and both of them played off um, for a big prize and of course Coventry have gone again uh, this year as well and uh, are having a good season uh, just outside the playoffs and in the semi-finals of the FA Cup. So it does show that you can get up there. You can compete with the big boys, the parachute payments, it's which have enjoyed success as well, of course, this season, having come straight up from League One. Um, so we're very, very optimistic and we feel very bullish about the future. I think it'd be really reassuring to fans that the club are always looking to grow those revenue streams, always looking to, to sort of get money, more money, because of course that'll end up on the pitch and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be successful that way. Um, one of the things we asked supporters in the survey was for, uh, whether they had any questions for some of the engagement channels that we already have through the club at the moment. So whether they wanted to ask questions um, for us to put into the fans conference or for, for us to put forward in the matchday experience working group. Uh, and of course, one of the fan engagement channels we have at the moment is the Heritage and Advisory Board, where rep fan representatives meet with the owners quarterly. Um, the most common questions fans wanted us to put to the owners in those meetings was about the, the North Stand redevelopment. And I think you touched a little bit there on the importance of non match day income. Um, obviously we, we will put that to the owners in those meetings but what can you share with the wider fan base now about that potential North Stand redevelopment? What are the timelines? What are the triggers? When could that happen? Yeah well the first phase obviously has been to make sure and improve what we've got and make it safe and secure and I'll just run through the numbers and the investment that's been made in the North South Stand and Milton Ends uh, to bring that all together. We've obviously introduced safe standing, rail seating into the Fratton End and into the Milton End as well, which protects that capacity. If we hadn't have done that, and because we have persistent standing issues or had persistent standing issues in those stands, then under the new legislation which permits uh, rail seating to be placed, we would have had to have done that or Raced, uh, faced the risk of doing all this work and having capacity reduced. So the most obvious space then to look towards, and our vision still remains, um, to increase capacity in the North Stand. Uh, what we can't be specific on is the timing of that. Um, and I'll just give you some indications as to why that might be. So if you look at three stand developments in, the, in English football at the moment, the three most recent ones uh, are Fulham, uh, to redevelop that stand and create 4,000 seats uh, was a spend of 80 million, which increased to 120 million pounds. Uh, the next one is um, Nottingham Forest, who have plans to, to start to develop the Peter Taylor stand. Uh, that is designed to, guarantee, to, to look at another um, 5,000 seats. Uh, and the cost of that is gonna be around about um, 95 million pounds. And then you've got Liverpool, as well who are increasing their capacity that will create probably 7,000 seats at about a cost of 80, 80 to 85 million pounds is, 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 is going to be the final cost of that particular scheme and they've had one or two issues as, as, as did Fulham with building contractors which in a world um, which we've seen we've been lucky here in that we've had you know brilliant um, support from PMC who delivered everything um, on time and very much to budget those schemes have gone way out of control and you've got you know, 30, 40 million pound increase on spend. So given those numbers and given those benchmarks, I think people can begin to see how much a new redeveloped North Stand to create five to 8,000 seats might cost. I don't think you're gonna get much under 60 million pounds investment. We'll try our best to value engineer it, but you've gotta be careful because when we do that stand, we wanna make it really, really special. We want to make sure that stand sweats 
365 days a year. And there's ways of doing it. So if you start to do the maths on it and look at what it means. So at the moment, after you sell a match ticket, um, the yield on a seat is roughly around about 15 to 16 pounds after you take the VAT out on your ticket sales, account for the concession mix that we have for seniors and for under 18s. That's the average value of a ticket. Uh, if you multiply that up by 5,000 over 23 games, then you end up with a sum of about 1.75 million. Add on another three pounds spend per head for each person behind the bars, which is currently what we get, you get to two million. So very quickly, you compare the two million extra revenue that 5,000 seats would create on match days compared to the costs I just mentioned. Wow, you're looking at a huge um, amount of money to fund with return of investment over you know, several decades. So there are other ways of doing it. And you know, we're looking at the land that we own um, uh, at the back of the uh, North Stand. And you know, can we redevelop that? The local plan sets out that there are plans for um, a residential development for say 450 units, housing units, uh, potential hotel uh, going in there as well. And that will go, it won't raise all the money, but it will go a significant way towards uh, that, that sum that's required to build a stand. Not all of it, but then you can narrow the gap and then you can start to think about reduces the number of years you need to fund it over. The other thing is making the stand, as I said, sweat on non-match days. So building some more event conference facilities in there, which may complement a hotel uh, if we can find a, a partner who'd be willing to develop a hotel in Portsmouth. And there's quite a few of them at the moment. Um, there's insufficient hotel space in Portsmouth. Uh, we've got the fantastic work that Portsmouth Port are doing to develop the cruise industry uh, and they need ho hotel bedrooms as well for stop offs. So we think there's huge potential to do that. So we've got to go through all those different processes, find partners who are willing to build it with us, potentially buy that land of us to give us the money to enable the development of the North Stand. And then the biggest issue we still have, and we talk about it so many different times, is conditional on that, one of the conditions we know to regenerate the whole area, not just Fratton, and, but you know, Milton as well, and, and, and Fratton with what the Pompey Centre want to do, what um, Portsmouth City Council want to do with um, the bridge uh, and, Fratton, and Fratton High Street, is we need um, the, the station and an access to the station uh, to be significantly improved, otherwise the area just can't cope with the extra traffic that will come in from all these different things that are going on and it needs to be safe. Um, we need something built away from Goldsmith Avenue uh, so that um, whether it's on match days or non-match days, people can go to and from the station um, with confidence uh, and, 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 and do it safely. So those are things that are, are, are very much paramount, very much part of my everyday work here, working with um, loads of different stakeholders, um, be it the City Council, be it um, the Pompey Centre, be it Southwest Railways, be it Network Rail. Um, and you know, we've got brilliant support from our MP as well in terms of trying to bring everybody together to, to, to work together. And we're making really good progress in terms of understanding what that might all mean and, and, and how we can work together to deliver something which will be very special for the football club. So that's what we want to do for the North Stand. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. We need to bring this whole project together and get all these different component parts to be interwoven and to come together so we can make it happen. Um, but, um, you know, I can, and I don't want to put a number on what that North Stand might hold. Um, the good thing that's been done with the design of the lower tier is that lower tier has been designed so we can take the top off the upper tier, if you like, and then go over, build back, go higher and increase. Uh, and again, I've got to understand the timings of that because we had enough uh, uh, challenges in terms of relocating 2,000 season ticket holders uh, back in 21-22 uh, for the uh, redevelopment of the North Stand. Um, it could be significantly more if we have to do that stand. So we have to get everything together to make it work. But the ambition is certainly to do that and remains so to do so. And that's why the owners have been sort of so keen to strategically, um, you know, we've, we've bought some properties in and around the ground so we can make that a reality. So anybody who questions the long-term ambition of that, um, can, I can reassure them that um, that's a commitment that we still have. Mm. You mentioned there that one of the barriers to, to that sort of redevelopment is the transport links uh, at Fratton train station. We know the club are pushing really hard in that area and we know you've got a plan to, to sort of work with stakeholders to improve that. That was one of the areas that fans said that they were least happy about at the moment, the transport links to the stadium. The other was the Youth Academy. 
Yeah. I think there's all sorts of really visible progress that you, yourself and the owners and, and every, all the club staff are working on. You know, we're top of the league in the, the men's and the women's. Uh, the sta stadium's the best it's been in, in several decades. I think the, the, there's far less visible progress being made in the academy. And, and today, I think this is some news outlets are reporting that you know, many of the, the club's current crop of youngsters are going to be released. Is it a fair assessment at the moment that perhaps the academy is underperforming a bit? Well, you mentioned a key word there, visible. Uh, and I, I think um, underneath the surface, there's lots of good things going on in the academy. For example, the owners have increased the investment when it previously in 2017, I think there was about a half a million pound investment a year in the academy. Uh, that's now up to a million pounds. So we've doubled the investment in that one. And I think um, as well, you talked uh, about the um, players that have been released. Those are incredibly tough decisions for both the club, for the players and the families and delivery of those decisions is never easy, particularly when you know, those boys have been on a journey, some of them from the age of eight, nine, some of them maybe a little bit shorter, but nevertheless, some of them may have anticipated the decision, um, some of them um, may, may have been uncertain, but certainly that shock is always very, very difficult to deliver. But we've got to be honest. And one of the things um, that is really important is we need to ensure that any boy we take on to profession, we're not giving it out of sympathy or hope. It has to be that they've got a realistic prospect of hitting the first team soon. And that's what we've been trying to do with the other under-21 players that we signed. Terry Devlin, for example, um, is number 21 player that we've signed in from Northern Ireland and has made an instant impact into the first team. Uh, we've seen Toby Stewart progress um, by getting opportunities to play at a quite a high level in a, in a, in a side-chasing promotion at Gosport. Uh, and uh, that's given him valuable game time. So we have to be sure that the players we take on can probably play to that, at least that minimum standard as part of their next pathway. So we're working um, hard on that, but yeah, it's a very tough decision. And I think there's some statistics at play when you look at, say, the most obvious thing that people look at in your academy is productivity, um, in terms of players that go on to make professional contracts. Um, Presume success, I, there's a little I, bit delayed. You know, if we're doing yeah. well in the academy, it's not yeah. going to feed through for a number it, of years. It's not going to feed through. And if you look at the academy system as a whole, there's 10 to 10,000 to 12,000 boys in the academy. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's likely at the, that's at the age of nine. Um, and 0.5% of them go on to get a professional contract. Uh, it's a harsh, tough, really hard hard world for these boys to to actually make the grade and if you go in to look at another statistic there's across the 92 clubs um, that you know most of them have academies um, I think it's two or three that don't but um, of those scholars aged 18 78 percent will not be involved in football by the age of 22 mm. uh, and, and that and that is that's how tough it is to actually make the grade and, and deliver it and you do your best to prepare it so what can we do we can prepare the conditions for success at a much younger level for those boys to come through and um that's probably where we're seeing some really good progress being made you do not with young people switch the, switch the lights on or click the fingers and suddenly they're talented as you just said it takes a bit of time to come through so Greg began his overhaul of the academy in 2021, we're sort of three years into that. We've increased the number of um, scouts we have working the academy from one or two to over 10 now, um, not just based in this area, but based around the country. We saw that with the recruitment of um, Connor May, um, a first year scholar last year coming down from the north of Scotland. And doesn't get much further away than that in terms of the UK to come down. Um, but at that foundation phase level, the foundation phase is boys 8 to 12, um, we have significantly improved um, the opportunities and relationships um, for local football clubs. So James Marlowe, who's our head of academy coaching, uh, runs uh, three sessions a year for local football clubs, grassroots clubs from the CPD. That has, that's twofold. One, it helps the football club build relationships. So those clubs trust Portsmouth Football Club, which quite frankly, they didn't do a few years ago. And they were more willing to send their talented players elsewhere. Um, and secondly, it gives those coaches access to our own coaching um, programs and techniques, which they can use to overall improve um, youth football in Portsmouth. So it's a win-win situation. 
Uh, when we started it, when Greg started it two years ago and James, they had probably about three or four clubs turn up. Now there's 80 clubs, boys and girls, coming as far away as Worthing uh, to Poole um, uh, and from the north of the county up to Basingstoke. So that net is now widening and that's where we want to work really, really hard on. The 8 to 12s this season have played um, games, match games against Category 1 and Category 2 sides. They performed, not only they performed well, but they won lots of matches, which shows that that talent now is coming, coming really, really through. As you get older, into that 13 to 16, the youth foundation phase, obviously recruiting becomes much harder because that talent probably has already been snapped up, but we continue to look there. But I'm encouraged by the under 15s um, in particular. We had um, a number of them step up to play in the Merit League. Uh, I think we had two boys in the Merit, last Merit League fixture under 18 level who stepped up three age groups, performed well, and you know, we won against Sutton United in, in that game, which was the last game that they played. So um, it's about creating those opportunities, playing players up where we, where we can, getting the recruitment right, getting the relationships right, um, we've got some very good, talented staff, young, energetic, dynamic staff. That becomes a problem hanging on to them because in the same way as um, if, you, if they're really good, then they reach a ceiling in a Cat 3 academy and want to move on to maybe Cat 2, Cat 1. But we want to give them every optimism and every reason why they should stay at Portsmouth Football Club and help us develop this next generation. Nobody, no supporter, whichever which football club you are, no one loves more than seeing one of their own come through. And I'll just say to those boys who have been unlucky today, um, some of them may go on to have professional careers. I really hope they do. And you have to look you know, at Marlon Pack uh, as a great example, released by the club just after he graduated from the academy and went on to have a really good career and is now captaining uh, Portsmouth Football Club in one of its most successful seasons for many years. Um, I had at MK Dons, uh, uh, a lad called George Williams who got released at 18, um, went on to university at, um, uh, at Loughborough, uh, got himself um, a semi-pro deal at Worcester City, got snapped up by Barnsley, won promotion from Barnsley from League One to the Championship, came back the following season to MK Dons where he was vice-captain. Mm -hmm. So there is that, there is that no, 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 nothing finishes here for them. Um, and for some of them, it gives them the opportunity to go off and find um, opportunities potentially at college or university, get their careers in place and give them sufficient time to do that. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's not just about productivity. It's about making sure that we can create a long term success. And as I said, you just can't snap your fingers and make it happen. But we're committed to it and we really believe in the academy structure. Um, away ticket sales have been quite a big discussion point online recently and uh, lots of discussion about loyalty points and inevitably of course there's a big fight for tickets at the moment. Um, the survey results showed that 74% of fans actually back that loyalty point system. People really agree with the principle that the more you go to the games and support the team on the road, you know, the, the more you should be prioritised for, for ticket sales. Um, I think that's particularly impressive in the context of a, a promotion season where, of course, you know, tickets will sell out and people will be disappointed. Um, are there any potential tweaks that can be made to sort of further improve the system, though? You know, are the club looking to sort of eventually phase out loyalty points in terms of sort of will they expire after a season or two for fans? Will, uh, could the club sort of put a small allocation on general sale for each match day? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I read the comments and it's fantastic, you know, to see the demand for away tickets. As soon as we put a, a game on sale, um, we're getting through the seller, whatever, whether we have 4,000 tickets as we did for Saturday, uh, or whether we have a much smaller number of tickets, they go almost instantaneously. Uh, and that support is, is magnificent. So I just want to thank everybody who makes that sacrifice. Sometimes we've had this season two long trips back to back and Tuesdays, Saturdays, and that support is unwavering. And, and, and it means so much to all of us that, you know, we've got that. So the most important thing is that we allocate those tickets in the fairest way possible. And to do that, it's not just about the football club making that judgment. It's important that we work with supporters to involve them in a big decision that affects them most. Uh, it's very much been a mantra of mine in all my career and all my time in football that we do that. So we do have an away ticketing group. We reviewed the system last year. We brought some tweaks in uh, to the system this year. Um, and we will continue to do that because we want to take on some of the feedback that's come through from that survey. But it won't be an individual 
sort of club mandate, this is now what we're doing, we will thoroughly discuss that uh, with the group to identify what the best way and the fairest way we can continue to improve tickets. I think um, this year, obviously, we've, we, we, we've identified that um, season ticket holders uh, should have the extra points, so everybody who was a season ticket holder automatically got 23 points. And what we will do over time as well, one of the things we're looking at is to make the loyalty point scheme uh, rolling so that um, maybe after every two or maybe probably three years, mm. that your, your point from that third season back revert to zero and you go again so that people can always sort of come in and join the system and those that continue to go regularly aren't penalised in any way. But that's all subject to discussion with the group. We'll do some further work over on that in the summer. Uh, Mark needs to make sure that if we do that rolling system, that the systems are robust and can cope with it. Um, and that um, we get to a stage where that ticketing system is continued to be perceived as fair as a lot of people obviously from the survey felt it was but you never find a perfect system and we're going to come up to a big game at Lincoln City where tickets are going to be very minimal um, and again I think it's all important that we work together to make sure that um, those tickets do go in the fairest possible way to the right people. Mm. I think that sort of rolling system you described there is really important just to make sure that younger fans that you know haven't got that big history of, of travelling away can get access to that still but I know that's something you're, yeah. you're really keen on. I think a three-year three rolling system will help that mm. as, as, as their support grows and um, and, 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 and then the points become meaningful and, I, and I, the other, the other, the other conundrum you've got is um, you may have a, a long-standing season ticket holder who suddenly wants to bring you know, their young children and they've got the points but the young children haven't and that makes it difficult so those are all things that I think we need to just see if there is a, is a right way of doing it. I don't think we'll ever find perfection though. <laughs> Um, you spoke there about how important it was to you to sort of involve fans in the decision making progress and that process sorry. and I think you know today really shows that you know you're really keen to listen to feedback. I think one of the big successes of your time here have been, has been the Matchday Experience Working Group. 91% um, of people said that since that group's been set up the experience of Fratton Park's been better for them on a match day, which I think is a great vote of success. Just for people that haven't maybe followed that as closely or, or don't sort of know necessarily much about that, what are some of the successes that have arisen out of that group that have now improved the, the experience for fans? Yeah, well, firstly, I think we've got a fantastic track record of um, supporter engagement at this football club, which obviously, you know, has its roots back in fan ownership. And it's good to see that that's been continued. It's a big part of the football governance bill, which you've already mentioned that's come out today. So um, we're in a really good place with that. We have, the, obviously, you mentioned the H&A board, uh, which can look at strategic issues involving um, involving the, um, the, the, the higher net worth earners and the, and, and, and the Pompey Supporters Trust. Uh, you've got um, the Tony Goodall Fans Conference, which brings all the supporter groups together. We have numerous um, supporter forums, which players um, attend, I attend, Rich attends, John attends throughout the season. I think there's one with Central Branch last night. Um, and uh, that's fantastic. Um, the only thing I, th I felt with those where they was a bit sort of question and answer session. And what it doesn't do is harness all the creativity, enthusiasm, passion that exists amongst the supporter base to actually come together to look at particular issues. So uh, we talked about the way ticketing group earlier on, but match day experience was a natural one where uh, we could work together on to take away the questions and answers, but take particular themes uh, and, and, and look at what we're doing. So had again, had that one had its genesis in the North Stand and South Stand relocation meetings, which um, uh, by involving fans and in some of those challenges, uh, we got to some really good, good outcomes. So I think if we look at it, I look back at some of the successes of it, the work that was done in terms of the fan zone, um, not just in establishing it, but continuously looking to improve it, bring new ideas in. Piglet's Pantry attend those, so we, not only have we got the club executive involved in it with supporters, we've got our partners uh, in, in involved as well. I think in some of the areas of improving safety uh, has been key. Uh, we've um, obviously looked at the catering range as well. I think. Um, the beer range came up last year and again we were able to involve supporters in the choice of uh, the new beers that we, we put on stream. So Madri was you know, particular, particularly popular to replace Budweiser and it's really, really good because we can also share the feedback we get from mystery customer surveys which the league take, under, uh, take out and share those in a positive way to supporters and say, do you agree with that? What else could we do in this particular area where we're, we could do better? Um, so yeah, I'm grateful for the so grateful for the time um, that people give up to attend. They you know they go on for about two and a, two and a half hours sometimes going through each of those different projects, um, and the staff obviously give their time up as well because we can learn uh, and we can improve, uh, and that's very much part of the culture that we're trying to instill at Portsmouth Football Club. 
great stuff. Um, finally, we polled supporters on a couple of PST-led projects for the club's 125th anniversary. Um, I have to say I was particularly delighted. 99% of fans said they were happy with the statue. You don't often reach consensus with Pompey fans, so we're really, really thrilled about that. Um, we're also looking ahead to uh, one that fans are going to be able to see very soon. Uh, we asked them of their, uh, which former players they wanted to see on a street art mural. Uh, and we just about sort of arranged a date where we think fans are going to be able to see that, haven't we? We have, um, and we're coming up to Easter and the Derby game on uh, Tuesday the 2nd of April. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for the work that, that, that you've done and your team have done at PSD, um, we, we, we would, we're, we're looking to unveil that uh, mural uh, in time for that game. More details, I'm sure, to follow on that one. Um, but no, it's, it, it's been terrific. And I, I think um, you sort of mentioned there the statue as well uh, and again a brilliant supporter-led initiative to one of one of the club's greatest uh, individuals it's a, a legend and the statue is incredible um, i know a lot of attention and care went into that um, using a top top sculptor no no shortcuts were made the expense is truly worth it uh, and what a fitting legacy it is in our 125th year yeah we can put all the events on uh, and you know the committee have worked so hard on producing a range of cultural events bringing together former players for reunions um, you know some of the other things some of the little things like the program covers this year I know have gone down quite well uh, we put merchandise into the shop to celebrate it which has been hugely popular and as soon as we put a new range in it almost like sells out immediately so you can see the uh, demand for that um, and you know we've got um, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've had we've had we've had two, we've got two big things about uh, those are all the events and things you can do. But what legacy can you, can you leave behind from a, from that year to look forward? Because we're looking back at memories over 125 years, but you also use the occasion to look forward to the next 125 years. And we've got that fantastic statue in place, which is um, a true fitting memento to one of the club's greats. And I think the other legacy project um, that's come out this 125th year, which is going to inspire you know, generations of young people um, and half the population of Portsmouth is the women's team. And that was, a, again, a, a considered um, investment that um, Torn Anti made across the course of the summer, kept it separate from the men's club. So there is no accusation of, you know, the men's team subsidising the women's team, but we were able to take them semi-professional after the brilliant achievements last season. And this season, they sit proudly on top of the league as I speak. They need eight points to be certain of the league from the last five games, probably seven because their, 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 their goal difference is ridiculous uh, in terms of it being where it is. So, um, you know, we could be in a situation where, um, you know, we see them promoted to the championship, which is a whole new era next year in terms of women's football. So those will be two things that, you know, out of all the events and things that everybody's put together, two brilliant legacy projects that come out of this 125th year. And isn't it wonderful that at the same time we're celebrating all these former players, both the men and the women are writing themselves into the history books as well? Well, that would be the perfect end to the season, wouldn't it? Um, but let's not count any chickens. Um, we set ourselves up, you know, really, really well over these last 11, 12 games. Every time we've, you know, we are brilliant at coming back from adversity this season. I say we are, the team are. They've been fantastic. I mean, on Saturday, two late call-offs, having you know, set a team up during the week to play that game at Peterborough, having to change that. No excuses, no whining, absolutely get on, get on with it and, and, and achieve, you know, a fantastic result, which everybody, you know, enjoyed. And it was, I said, it was a real privilege to be there. But throughout the season, I think we've got 14 players at the moment who could for, form a team um, in, in, in the treatment room. And we've suffered not through short-term muscular injuries. They've tended to be longer-term impact injuries, which have really hurt us this season in terms of um, losing players. But players have stepped in and they've been absolutely brilliant. And I think that's testimony to the depth of squad that has been created um, and hopefully underlines the strategy, which is um, part of the plan of what we're trying to achieve here. So, yeah, we go into these last few weeks incredibly excited, but nothing's for certain. And uh, let's hope that, you know, we can sit down in a few weeks' time, Donald, and, and, and uh, re reflect on 125 years and a very special 125th year for Pompey. I look forward to it. Andy, thank you so much for your time. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.